Good evening, Twitch. Hello, YouTube. Welcome to Birth of a World. Tonight's episode, we're going to be talking about factions. Let's get started. Oop, uh, don't want that. Okay, there we go. Factions. So, what about factions? Factions are um, an essential part of any D&D campaign, really, of any RPG storyline. They're the the organizational groups that um, dispense either you know valuable motivation to your player characters, or they're just a useful source of side quests, or they're an impending menace. Uh, they they fill all, factions fill several important roles basically as just groups of people, groups of actors that are not the players, generally speaking, um, uh, that you then that can that drive the story in some way, really, that interact with the story in some way. So this. So this evening's episode is going to be all about what, how factions work, what they are, how to come up with factions, how to brainstorm ideas for factions, uh, and we'll define some factions for our campaign setting here. Uh, for anyone who's new to the program, uh, who's watching, this is an interactive podcast, so you're welcome to ask questions in the chat and I'll try and answer them. Uh, additionally, I'll be ans asking chat for suggestions periodically um, when I get stumped or feel like there's something that could use a bit of uh, groupthink. But first, let's remind ourselves what we're looking at. So this is the world of our campaign setting so far, broken down into hexes uh, and colored by terrain. We have the Daggershore Vale area, which is where the player characters will be coming from along this red line here, which is a train track. Uh, we have the mountainous kingdom of Alvilda uh, over here to the southwest. And to the northeast, we have the plains and desert area of Kazal. And we made a few notes, a few very extensive notes um, about these two neighboring regions, which uh, when we publish this will all be made available online. Um, but essentially we said that Alvilda is a uh, Norse-inspired civilization of elves. Um, they are ruled by a king and a royal, by a queen in a royal court. Um, the queen holds power. Uh, it is a, matri a matrilinear line. So the queen holds power above the king, un unlike uh, in most European nations. Um, the Dagger Shore Vale is a conglomeration of city-states all kind of federated together um, with a council, uh, the Council of Daggers, uh, and uh, they participate in basically mutual defense and they do trade together and stuff like that, but they're basically a federation of city-states. And Kazal is really big, we decided, uh, it's a large, prosperous place, primarily occupied by dwarves, um, with some tiefdoms too. Uh, and it's heavily capitalistic. Um, money rules the land, as we kind of noted here. Um, and that people have uh, monetary... Wealthy individuals have monetary fiefdoms. Um, there's a problem, though. The area where the party first, where the first adventure takes place here near Tincliffe in the Mountains of Metal is in disputed territory, and as our story progresses, Alvilda and Kazel are preparing to march further and further towards war over this resource-rich area on Kazel's border, which has up until now been underexploited. Um, so that's kind of what's going on in the grandest possible zoom-out level of the world. Now we're going to kind of take a step inward, zoom in a bit more, uh, and try and come up with some factions outside of just these two nation governments uh, and figure out what their roles will be. So uh, in keeping with the general principle of uh, conservation of detail, hello Tice8769, welcome to chat. Feel free to ask questions. Um, so we're zooming into a slightly level, slightly finer level than nations now. We're talking about factions and groups of individuals. Um, I think a good place to start with this is probably actually going to be uh, with the care, the people around the party. Um, kinds of the, the rule of conservation of detail says you fill in the details that the party are most likely to interact with first. So let's talk about things going on near where the party are for their first three adventures. So drink of water here. So for the first three adventures, um, we've talked about, okay, we have the starter cave, the starter mine in Tincliffe, and then we go into the ice cave, uh, where, we where we fight some orcs, uh, which we populated in a few episodes back, uh, and we encounter a demon in disguise who convinces the players to break the mirror 
uh, and cause everything to go to hell. Um, here's the, the magic mirror artifact that we've talked about. It's kind of the central plot MacGuffin. Well, Tice, if you remember watching this before, please uh, feel please do subscribe if you haven't uh, already, and uh, feel free to check out my back episodes on YouTube. Uh, this video, as well as all my other videos, get posted to YouTube, uh, usually the same night that they're done. So if you're unable to watch or you miss a few episodes and you want to catch up, feel free to go check out my YouTube channel. Um, link is below the video. Um, so after we've gone into the Tincliff mine, the players are going to travel onwards to Kazal. Um, basically, they were stuck in Tincliff because the an avalanche took out the train tracks. But now they can continue onward to the city that they're heading to for their own personal reasons, which are up to the players to figure out. Um, when they arrive, they hear news of the, the central plot thread, really, the stuff that's going on with uh, creatures from other planes going crazy and attacking people in nearby locations. Now, this is all. This, this central plot is going to drive itself pretty well because it's an existential threat to the re fabric of reality. <coughs> um, so uh, the players should be pretty motivated to, to interact with that, but they're going to need to meet some people along the way. We're going to need to have more than just the players... Um, being kind of a band of murder hobos rampaging through um, this campaign world um, on their quest to stop everything from coming unraveled. So we are going to need to come up with a few factions, and these factions, some of them will be allies, some of them will be enemies, and some of them will be neutral. Um, kind of, we have to fill all these roles. Um, so let's talk about factions, and let's start with the uh, Mountains of Metal. Now, without switching tabs too much here, in the Mountains of Metal we talked about how Tincliff is a village inhabited by tieflings, uh, uh, demon-touched people. Uh, and they, um, they're they kind of oppressed. They, they're kind of seen as a, a lower class um, amongst Kazal. They're, they're subjugated, um, and they're largely... They're more or less slaves um, to their kind of the dwarven masters who own, uh, in this case, the mine they're working, but really... Uh, any, the, 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 their dwarven boss owns their entire town. I'll see if I've got that in my notes somewhere here. It's going to be in... I have too many text documents now. Uh, so let's see here. So yeah, we just said basically that it's all owned by a cartel of wealthy dwarves. Uh, and the NPCs we're interacting with. Hello Viking, welcome. Sorry about the ads, I can't do anything about those uh, without, I think, being a Twitch partner, and then I get to control when they happen. Um, welcome to the channel. Uh, anyway, so we're in Tincliff, and we've got these halfling, these tieflings, rather, and they're being oppressed by dwarves. So, obviously, this cartel of wealthy dwarves here, that seems like an excellent place to start for defining fat new factions. So let's cut back over to my factions list here, and I've got kind of this checklist, so... Uh, let's do... Yes. And we'll give them a proper name in a second here. Uh, so they are the Uh, so they're the owners of Tincliff. They own Tincliff, basically the whole town, the mine, everything, the, everything but the people. Uh, we decided that Kazal does not actually practice slavery, um, so we, they're not actually slaves. They're just wage slaves, basically. Monetary serfdom, I think, is the right term, but uh, someone with better humanities education than me can answer that. Um, so one thing uh, it's good to have for a faction is a symbol, basically an icon. Uh, here, I've got a few, I can pull up a few examples, just a second here. Uh, come over here. Let's get this Firefox tab in here. Okay, so this is from my blog, um, which is linked in the video, uh, if you can't read it or something like that. But um, I'm, here I'm outlining uh, the 13 demigods that rule my other campaign setting, Terra Dahar. But the, the key thing here is that everything's got a symbol that it can identify itself with. Everything's got a banner. That indicates that provides some indication, some relation to um, their role in the universe. So, for instance, for Headmaster Azan here, he is a 
uh, War Mage Academy founder and military leader. So his is this kind of fireball symbol, um, which in the campaign is called the Triflame. Uh, Sif is the healer turned lich, turned back to, turned demigod. It's complicated. Um, uh, so she's kind of the, she's known as the patron of healers, physicians, but also as a death god um, because she was a lich. So she's got this kind of green and black, but still kind of, kind of verging towards the kind of the cross symbol that's used for uh, healers, you know, in the real world. Um, last example I'm going to talk about here is Eliadriana, the Wanderer, whose symbol is this really, really stylized compass. But you can kill, still kind of see, you know, okay, it's a compass, it's got a point and a north and stuff like that, and that's kind of the symbol. So that's kind of what we're talking about here, something that can be described in a word or two. Um, and that's kind of visually evocative. It doesn't have to be actually, you know, as detailed. You know, I could say a white compass pointing left of north on a uh, black and purple field. But that's a lot to say. It would be rather just to say something simple like uh, the symbol of Elidriana uh, and have explained it maybe once to the party. And if they don't quite remember, that's okay because you're helping them make that connection with, okay, I hear this thing, I means this person who does this stuff. Um, so for Azan, we'd say the Triflame, uh, and the, the red and gold Triflame uh, of Headmaster Azan. And when I'm at the table explaining this, I always say right away, you know, I followed up with, here's the symbol, here's what it's for. Um, so it's kind of important to be able to say that in a single breath uh, without having to stop too long to describe stuff. Uh, if you want to take a look at my blog, go right ahead. The link is also below the video. Um, I'll also link that article on the YouTube stream later on. So, suggestions for symbols for the mining cartel. We have Tice saying, uh, well, they could have a coin with a bronze cog. It represents that nothing works without them. I like that. I like, that's a very kind of, uh, that's a very evocative symbol. Um, a coin with a bronze cog. So you would mean like a, a, like a, uh, like the cog's actually embossed on the coin. Like, like they're minting coin. Like, this is almost something you get minted. Yeah, is that what you're talking about, Tice? Yeah, you said you like that. Viking seems to like that. All right, I'm gonna put that down. Coin embossed with a bronze cog. Um, so the thing is, like having a coin. And I really like that. Yeah, is that they that they can carry it around as kind of a symbol of their authority, of their membership in this uh, elite group, if you will. So it's like a badge almost, like for like you know a police badge or something like that. I really like that. Thank you, Tice. That was a great suggestion. Um, so member composition is going to be uh, so the the company owners, right? So uh, I'm going to say three very wealthy dwarves. We'll give them names later, maybe. Uh, we'll give them names if they if they become relevant to the storyline. Uh, it's generally how we do things around here. Territory. Uh, we said kind of generally. Um, We know at least one so far is Tin, Cl is tin Cliff, which is their tin mine. <coughs> activities. So um, what I mean by activities is kind of uh, what are they up to? What are, their, what are they doing to forward their own interests? And really, what are their interests? In this case, they're, 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 they're a business, right? They're a business cartel. So their interests, their activities are mostly just making sure that the you know, ore keeps flowing out and coin keeps flowing in. Another thing they can be doing is keeping their workers subdued, right? 
Uh, we've talked about, we kind of want to paint the, the tieflings in this area as kind of a downtrodden underclass, because um, that will help motivate the players to want to uh, save their town, basically, when the mine gets taken over, right? The mine belongs to this cartel. Uh, the mine belongs to this cartel. The players don't really feel motivated to help them until you point out that, well, there's this whole town of poor folk who are really dependent on this mine uh, and the money their cartel gives them to run it. Uh, and suddenly, it you know you you pull on that little string, that little that little heart string, and then uh, people the players start to resonate, and that's really what we want to get, especially especially from this very first town. You know, we're trying to really get the players a feel for this world here. We've said that it's a industrial revolution era kind of, era kind of world. You know, locomotives and steamships, and possibly uh, eh, locomotives, steamships, and rifles kind of world. Um, although with magic also as a resource. Um, Viking suggests also ensuring small, possibly competitive mining groups fail, and yeah, uh, let's let's do keeping out the competition. Um, I want to make a note on this. They stand to lose quite a bit from a war between uh, um, bah, Alvilda um, and Kazal. Right, if if fighting starts happening in the mountains, uh, that bad news, bad news there. Uh -huh. So Tice, well, I do encourage uh, any GM who's interested in this stuff to uh, take it and play it with their own group. My groups generally tend not to be uh, evil aligned. I had one very memorable group when I was first starting out DMing who were evil aligned, and they actually. They started out evil, and though I gave them many opportunities to practice evil, they ultimately wound up drifting in towards good, um, because they wound up siding with a, a choosing a side that uh, wound up actually having the moral high ground in the grander scheme of things. They kind of they had to choose their al again. It goes back to factions. Actually, they had to choose who their allies were going to be, <laughs> and they chose a group that certainly could use evil players at the time. Uh, and then they kind of drifted towards good because, what it, what what is there's that quote from, I think I said there's a quote from Chronicles of Riddick or something like that, right? Sometimes you don't fight evil with good. Sometimes you fight evil with a different kind of evil. Um, and these guys were the, the different kind of evil, um, that kind of uh, chaotic neutral, ev chaotic neutral only kind of evil um, party. And that was my my group from when I very, very was first starting out DMing, and I learned quite a bit about uh, running evil parties, but ultimately, I find at least the people I play with want to be heroes. Uh, they want that praise and recognition and to be famous in their worlds eventually. Um, I guess it's just the kind of groups I gravitate to, so I don't worry too much about the players turning out being evil. Uh, that said, if anyone wants to run this stuff, again, with an evil party, go right ahead. I really want to see what happens. Uh, I'm really interested to hear what happens with that. So, um, it's in this company's interest to keep a war down, which might come into play later on as we kind of express, start exploring that uh, war subplot. Plot hooks. Um, I'm going to leave this area out for now, but generally speaking, uh, let's see. Well, we can put in a few things. We can say, like... Uh, There's a few kind of just generic plot threads that we might uh, later choose to take up with this party. Um, so we need a name for this part faction, right? We want to say this faction is run by, uh, we want to say, you know, the town of Tincliffe is run by not just a dwarven mining cartel, but a specific mining cartel. So we've got the Im symbol of the bronze cog, right, as their, um, as their icon. So I kind of just want to call them the bronze cog. I think it's a pretty good name. Uh, so that's, I think I'm going to just go with that. The Bronze Cog Cartel. That sounds pretty sinister, actually, in a kind of steampunk dwarven way. I really like it. Um, so thank you, Tice, again, for suggesting that kind of that symbol. Um, I think that works nicely for our kind of first one. So 
So let's see some suggestions for their plot hooks here is uh, a miner's family is starving because a rebellious worker was maimed, uh, for example, or... Um, Oh hey, welcome uh Tatar Dead. Tatar Dead. Uh welcome to the channel, Tatar Dead. The Copper Cog Cartel. That's uh if you want to go alliterative, that's definitely a way to go. Um I, I think the thing with alliteration is it tends to make it sound more humorous. Um if we want these guys to these guys are meant to be kind of menacing, uh and I think if you if you go with the copper cog cartel, I'm I would have a hard time saying it with a perfectly straight face. Whereas I can say, you know, uh, agents from the bronze cog cartel walk into town. You can see they are busting for a fight by their weapons carried openly along with their bronze along with their uh, badges of authority. You see, kind of you kind of start painting it kind of western tones almost. But uh, whereas you can compare that with Officers of the Copper Cog Cartel walk into town. They look like they're busting for a fight because they're carrying their weapons openly and are heavily armored. You see, it kind of it doesn't just doesn't quite punch as hard. Um, you want to. So, actually, this is a, this is an interesting tangent. But uh, when when you're creating stuff, especially naming things, naming stuff is hard. Generally speaking, coming up with really good names for things takes a lot of effort. So if you're if you're a new DM and you're trying to come up with names for things, one simple thing you can do is try and say it in a, a menacing voice. Try and say, you know, the Copper Cog Cartel. You know, uh, try try and actually voice it different ways. Like you can say, I can, you know, the Bronze Cog Cartel, um, the Bronze Cogs, if you will, uh, things like that. You know, you can say it in a bunch of different ways and try and figure out if it carries the right tone um, you want to sell. You want to sell like the Copper Cog Cartel. Um, it's also kind of hard to say, but I might just be thirsty. Uh, but thank you, Tatarded, for this for this in, uh, interesting digression. Um, we might use we might use that like I don't know. We've used cogs now, but I think we could possibly have other cartel, other business cartels, kind of operating in Kazel. We've established that the whole nation is basically a, a capitalist nightmare, um, well, a capitalist's dream, but a nightmare of capitalism. Uh, if you will follow my meaning. Um, so we kind of want to figure out um, other business interests as well, other trusts. Maybe we can have a few like, like you know, like a 30s era kind of, or 20s era kind of business trust, like, uh, you know, they control all the oil or whatever. Uh, we can come up with other groups as well. So that's kind of our first, our first group, though, is these bronze cogs. Um, maybe later we can come up with a slur for them also that the tieflings use. Um, so I heard, saw a mention of rebels um, back up the chat aways here. Let's talk about rebels actually. I think that's another thing we could have is kind of um, maybe not actively rebels but more like uh, more like you know people who are trying to sabotage or shut down the bronze cog cartel because they're exploiting their people. Um, so let's talk about that. I feel like this could be, you know, we have an antagonistic group in the Mountains of Metal. We're only staying in the Mountains of Metal for a few sessions, but we would probably come back here, especially if the uh, war subplot goes off and winds up uh, with this area being actually the scene of quite a lot of action. But yes, yes, Tate, yes, Tate Hearted, we want to have uh, f freedom fighters uh, who occasionally want to go and sabotage um, the, the Bronze Cogs business and stuff like that. So let's see here. Um, So these are these are rebels in the in the kind of social order sense, if not in the they're an organized fighting force sense. Uh, 
they believe that they are a underclass, um, you know, that they are a subject, they're a subjugated race, uh, and maybe they're right. Uh, we haven't decided yet. Um, and they have chosen to take up arms against uh, the organizations that they seem as responsible for the lowered status of their race. Um, so, chat, if you want to try coming up with a symbol, you knocked it out of the park with the bronze cog symbol, so I will uh, let you guys take another stab at coming up with a symbol for these guys. Horn breaking a chain. Horn breaking a chain of cogs. Or a war hammer. Okay. We have a couple good suggestions here. So we have Tice suggesting a horn breaking a chain of cogs. A horn being a natural symbol of tieflings, as many of them uh, do sprout horns from their heads, uh, and the chain of cogs is obviously, you know, crossing the symbolism of the bronze cog with the symbolism of uh, slavery and oppression. It's very, very evocative. Bit hard to say is the one thing that doesn't roll quite as well. He says, you know, the symbol of uh, a chain of cogs being broken by a horn. Um, it can be said in one breath, but it doesn't flow quite as nicely. Um, but I, like, I want to use these symbols, though. I want to use these symbols. Uh, perhaps, perhaps. Um, how about a horn stabbed into a cog? Um, let me... Sorry, let's just sketch something out here. Uh, zoom. There we go. Do, 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 do. Uh, get my drawing implement out. Lines tool, right? Yes, okay, good. So I'm thinking something like. Oop. Ah. Sorry, I don't particularly like Inkscape. So just pretend that's a nice, straight, slightly curved horn. It would have like a. Cog, and then like. I'm terrible at just freehand drawing like this, but I think you get the idea where I'm going with here, or you will in a second when the line resolves. So kind of, ah, yeah. So so the idea, uh, my the idea I'm going with here is a uh, a horn stabbing into a cog, uh, like actually. Like, maybe we give this horn, like, we give this horn some details, maybe, but, uh, what do we think? We like the, the horn stabbing the cog? A lot of the chat, so chat are suggesting, uh, a fist crushing a cog as, as a fist is kind of seen as a symbol of freedom. Um, that's also a valid one, or a fist clutching a broken chain. That's another, that's another one, that's another good one, uh, Viking. Let's go back over to, uh our factions bit here, and switch this back to the map, there we go. Okay, so fitch, fist clutching broken chain or horn stabbing cog, what do we think chat? I'll give you guys a minute to catch up because um, we have that chat lag. Chat lag, 
For anyone who's joined us in the last half hour, this is an interactive podcast, and you are more than welcome to come participate in the discussion, ask questions, help me have ideas, uh, things like that. Uh, This is a collaboration. Okay, I'm going to go with, I'm actually going to go with the fist uh, clutching a broken chain. I think I do like that a bit better. It's also more kind of a universal freedom symbol, but uh, fist fist clutching broken chain. Um, The icon of it, the 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 symbol of a fist, and I'm... You, you can't see me, but I'm gesturing here with like my fist uplifted, like so the uh, I don't know. Mm-hmm. So I mean, maybe maybe these these tieflings, you know, while they focus on tieflings primarily because that's who they are, maybe they're more interested in kind of uh, you know wage equality and freedom for all the other subjugated peoples of Kazal. Uh, maybe they're just maybe they're part of a larger organization that protests against uh, you know uh, economic serfdom that has taken hold of the lower class of Kazal. Uh, what do people think about that? So Viking, I'm not even suggesting that they just that they're just fighting the bronze cogs right now. They're fighting all of the cartels, all of the trusts. They are fighting any organization that has a large number of employees who are too fo- who are too poor to live outside of company towns. Right? We are we are talking. We're to go go wider here. We're, we are a network of groups fighting societal issues. It just happens that the ones we specifically might encounter. Um, have beef with the bronze cogs and maybe one other, two other groups. Um, that's kind of what we're going with here. Uh, we're going a, a bit broader. So plot hooks. This should appeal more to the more like chaotically aligned. Um, I, oh yeah, that's one other thing. That's one thing I'm leaving out of a lot of this stuff is the faction alignment. Um, add that. Let's make the bronze cogs good neutral evil. Um, the most selfish alignment um, I think is befitting for a economic group that uh, gets rich off the backs of the poor and doesn't give anything back. Whereas the free tieflings, these can be chaotic to chaotic. I think like um, the al- having the alignment written down helps you. You know, like will a paladin associate with any of these people? No, but will a uh, but you know will will a party composed of with this co- with the kind of party composition you wind up with? So. If you've got evil characters, maybe they'll help fight against the rebels, right? If they see some, something eye to eye with the people who will enrich themselves off the backs of the poor. Um, plot hooks for the free tieflings. We're going to have things like, you know... Um, so one story, one story structure that I absolutely love is the heist. Um, it lends itself really well 
to to D and D especially a good heist where you actually like you have the re- you have the scouting elements you have the planning elements you bring in you know the party comes in does their thing you've got you the DM you've got a few surprises in store so that you know it the plan doesn't go quite according to, to doesn't go off without a hitch like it's it's a trope that's done to death but it makes for a really fun gameplay um, so we'll definitely put a heist put heist in as a possible plot hook um, other one is like. Um, something that player characters are often uniquely well suited to do, um, you know, in a war zone especially, is actually running supplies be- across uh, enemy lines. Uh, the player characters are usually not obviously associated with any one group unless they uh, have actually set themselves up that way, um, and they're usually pretty good at traversing terrain and getting through obstacles that you know standard uh, non-heroic characters might find impassable. Um, so one thing the players can do is be delivering supplies, messages, whatever, to uh, cut off forces. Um, so, for instance, had our story started differently, the player characters might have been sent in to Tincliffe to, like, deliver food or something and help them. Uh, and then we would have started off by cro- having to cross the mountains uh, on foot from Castle or from wherever the nearest train stop was. Things like that. Uh, what do you name... Need a name for this group of um, not just pro tieflings, but anti surf kind of people. This anti surfdom group. Um, give chat a minute. Uh, Okay, I suspect my chat view is frozen since I haven't seen anything since, uh, oh no, no, we're going, okay, we're good, sorry, just no one was saying anything, my bad. The free birds, the free fists, uh, no free bird, no viking, no free bird. Let's look at their, their symbol again, right? We have a, we have a fist and a chain. Um, how about we just call them the breakers? What do you think about that? Give chat a minute to catch up. Viking suggests the hollow wolves. We can also do that and go completely uh, orthogonal to what we've got right now, the hollow wolves. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. The Unchained, I think, hold on, hold on, whoa, stop the presses. I think Tartarded's got it, the Unchained, I liked it. I like that. I think that that gives us again. I'm just running through it in my head, right? We've got you know, you know, uh, the unchained, uh, you know, the uh, the rebel rebel forces of the unchained uh, attacked a uh, bronze cog stronghold last night. Seventy eight people were killed. No, um, it, it's got it's got uh, that good that good kind of weight to it. Like the 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 businessmen will curse the name of the unchained. Uh, and the the poor will you know 
did you hear the Unchained are recruiting? Yeah, are recruiting? Yes, I think I. Yes, I'm considering joining myself. You, you can't fight. Just watch me try. No, things like that. You know, um, situations like that. I feel like the Unchained uh, that will fit well into those kinds of conversations. Uh, so thank you, uh, Tatar did for um, coming up with that one. Uh, we've got time for doing one more, I think. If anyone's joined us uh, since last time I said this, feel free to join the conversation as we talk about um, kind of what's going to be our third and probably the last faction we're going to do for right now. Um, I feel like three is probably going to be a good number. This one, I want to be far... We've done two factions that are going to be well known. I want to do... Um, it's a trope, but you can have the, the poorly known, somewhat sinister faction, and I feel like uh, we should go with that. I think we should have a somewhat sinister faction for uh, this party also. Sinister in a different way. So, if I pull up the storyline again... So we talked about a demon tricks the player characters into activating these magic mirrors. There are 18 of them, all tied to a different plane. Uh, and uh, the world is coming undone because this magic mirror uh, is causing pieces of other planes to overlay around them, um, bringing through the denizens of other planes and stuff like that. So we want, uh, we want, yeah, basically, yeah, Tice, you got the right idea, a cult of some kind uh, that, uh, that, stand, that seek to gain something. Maybe we don't even know what yet. Uh, from the activation of these mirrors. Now, the activating was purely by happenstance. The players just did it by because they were manipulated by a demon. I think this faction here is just kind of going to be an opportunistic, um, basically seizing on the chaos that's coming in from it, or seizing on the existence of these uh, kind of leaking areas of other planes now uh, to their advantage. So... Um, I'm not thinking. I'm not thinking cultists so much, just because uh, it feels like a cult takes a while to develop. Um, and I, I'm not even sure we're going to encounter these people in the first uh, three adventures. They might show up a bit when we're in Kazel and we're dealing with the, the angel breaking through. Like maybe, hell, they could even send the players out there. They could be the ones to send it out there. We said it would be the. Uh, um, we said it would be the authorities of whatever city and castle we wind up in, um, but maybe it could be this organization too. So, um, instead of cult, instead of a cult, what if they're kind of unscrupulous scholars? What if they are, um, you know, scientists? I'm thinking like a, a I'm thinking like an organization of ma of magi who want to. Uh, exploit this effect maybe and are willing to fight against the party to do it um, and are willing to go go to unsavory means uh, to kind of achieve this so uh, so I'm going to put that down as our possibility here The reflectionists. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think they want to, they want to take control of these portals uh, with the ambition of maybe using them for you know travel potentially or who knows what. We're gonna probably not 
solve quite all of their reasons uh, at one go. Um, so for names for this group, if you guys want to, if you guys in chat want to start thinking about names while I fill in the details here, um, think not about like a name that reflects what their purpose is. Think instead about a good name for like a school or like a, uh, you know, like the Skull and Bones kind of that kind of organization, right? Like, like an old boys club almost. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what we're gonna where we're gonna go with this, but uh, uh, kind of kind of. A school, an, either a school or an organization within a school, um, rather than the rather than something that's you know directly indicative of oh they're looking for these mirrors. Um, so I'll let you guys brainstorm some of those while I finish the rest of this here. Um, Uh, let's see. So we got uh, suggestions from chat are the Iron Lanterns, the Blue Larks. Tice suggests the Multi University, and I approve. Uh. <laughs> uh, binders of the Velvet Secrets. That's a bit long one, but you could call them velvets or binders for a bit less of a, of a for a bit uh, less of a soft name. Red Relves. Anything else? Uh, well, you keep brainstorming. I'm just going to talk about, about some of the other choices I made here. So we're going to say they're wizards from a prestigious school because we want them to be everywhere and, you know, uh, have influence, basically. So uh, having being wizards from a prestigious school. This also means they're going to be, the average member age is going to be rather old. Um, you know, they're going to be, a, they're going to be, a, whereas the Unchained is probably mostly, you know, teenagers um, the, this organization is going to be, you know, adults and older people, uh, adults and elders, basically, who, ha you know, have wealth and resources and power um, that the Unchained, for instance, could never dream of having. Um, I'm going to say that they're a worldwide, or at least region-wide organization. We've only got a small, small corner of the world mapped out right now, um, but we can say that they're a region-wide organization. Um, and they want to locate and gain control of the mirrors for reasons that are still undefined, and we'll get to them. Um, plot hooks can be, we got two sides to this. This, this organization is an interesting position that they can be on either side of the um, player's good graces, basically. In fact, I almost expect that, that uh, when I run this, I'm probably going to try and start them out as seeming to be friendly, um, so seeming to be beneficial. They want to... Um, so my player group, is, uh, we're all engineers or scientists or mathematicians. We've all got kind of STEM backgrounds. So uh, I know my player characters, my players at least, I know my players will be uh, 
willing to uh, trust academics, basically. You know, I am a scientist. You can trust me. Uh, they'll be willing to trust these guys. So I'm probably going to play it that these guys are, you know, here to be beneficial. They're not interested in the war between, with Kazal and Alvilda. They're just here to study these mirrors. That's why it's very important when you're DMing to know uh, your players as well as what characters they are. Because um, there's some bits of their nature that they're not going to sidestep. And apologies to any of my players if they're watching. Lost Luck, are you in here? Nope. Okay. Lost Luck's not in here. <laughs> Good. So none of my players are watching this. Um, shut your ears. Uh, so, um, uh, so the players can be on either side of it, right? They can, these guys can be a useful source of information one way or the other, right? By, by the pen or by the sword, they can be useful information. Um, and, uh, uh, so let's see. So they can break into the stronghold. To, they, so, like I said, we're gonna, we've got an arc kind of here, right? They send the players after the mirror. They tell, send the players after more mirrors, or maybe they reveal their cards and the players want to go after them instead. Um, so that's kind of where we want to go. Uh, so, other suggestions. Uh, the Red Relves, the wielders of the tome, the Celestine orbs, I'm picturing big shiny balls now. Thank you, uh, Tartarded. Um, Celestian Celestian orbs. Yeah, that's a that could be a euphemism. Uh, I'm not against that, but that could be a euphem seen as a euphemism. Uh, the seventh chamber. I like that actually. The Celestine librarians. A eh, bit bit hard to say, but maybe. The University of the Omniverse. Uh, So I'm going to say this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to take both two things out of, out of what chat suggested here. I'm going to call the... Uh, so the, the school that this group is from, uh, they're all alumni or faculty from the Omniversal University. Uh, I think that's a very big, flowery, impressive name that a imposing educational institution might use. It's vaguely discworld. It feels vaguely Discworld to me, just the way it rolls off the tongue. It's like, uh, it's, it's something uh, Pratchett might, have, might write about, the Omniversal University. Um, I like it. Uh, and for the, and I actually want to call them the Seventh Chamber as the organization. Uh, and I'm going to go flying right off the, handle here, and I'm going to say that their symbol is actually the uh, coat of arms of the school. Um, or actually, I'll use uh, maybe? No, I want to say that they're, they're, they're a smaller group than that. They're not going to be the whole department, so they're not going to be using the department's symbol. Um, plot hook, there's an eighth chamber. I'm going to write that down. Because uh, uh, an eighth chamber might be useful uh, later on, especially if you want to take a, a breather and have like a, a... I expect this to be a very heavy, very dramatic campaign when we run it. Um, so certainly having some random humorous bits thrown in is always welcome. Uh, the meme can be that nobody knows how many chambers there are or how many chamber pots. Um, so seventh chamber, obviously you want to probably incorporate the number seven into their symbol somewhere. Um, um, let's do... Um, Let's, let's incorporate a symbol for conjuration. I like the, the idea of like the stone arch as a symbol for a portal. So let's do the eight, seven segmented arch. 
So you can picture a uh, so picture, if you will, a one of the banners like I had on the web page I showed you with a, a a stone arch on the a stone arch on a colored background that's split into like six segments, and then it has a keystone, right? The 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 uh, trapezoid shaped block at the very top. That's the keystone of the arch, and so that will be um, that will be our symbol. I think it's just the seven segmented arch, and that says a lot about conjuration. It, well, it implies a lot about conjuration. It implies a lot about what the organization is. But it's pretty opaque until you actually know what you're looking for, which if this is a secret organization, I feel like that's a good thing, um, that their symbol is not uh, overly flamboyant or recognizable immediately unless you know what it is you're looking for. Okay, so we have three factions here now that the players might encounter. Uh, in a subsequent video, we'll probably make more, but that won't be until the adventure has progressed probably um, quite a few sessions now. The seventh chamber are shaping up to be a nice oppositional organization. Um, currently, what we, well before today, what we had for opponents really was just random stuff that gets brought through from the mirror effect. Now we have someone with intent, someone organized and marshaled and coming at you, um, poses a much bigger threat. Um, and yes, Viking, I imagine the seventh chamber do think of themselves as the keystone of the multiverse. Uh, without us, everything would fall. I bet they think that. I bet they truly believe that they are, you know, they're a lawful neutral organization willing to go to any ends. Um, so it sounds like maybe they're misguided. Uh, this could. This is another, uh, it's actually a common villain trope I really like is the villains aren't actually, you know, out to destroy the universe. They're just misguided or selfish. Um, there's a, a saying, a, there's a line from, it's actually from Final Fantasy VIII. Um, with something Squall says once is there's no heroes or villains, there's only point of views, there's only points of view. Uh, and that's kind of a theme I like to use a lot uh, in my storytelling is that, you know, the villains have a motivation that's believable and they believe they're right. They believe what they're doing is for the better good um, and that you're trying to stop them and they think you're evil and all this sort of thing. Um, Tice is saying, I looked up seven universes and it's a thing. Just a second. Um, interesting. Okay. Um, I'll encourage people to Google that on their own. I, I Just a look at the article summary suggested as heavy religious overtones, and I don't want to get into that right now, um, especially right towards the end of my stream. So... Um, that's going to be it for tonight's episode. Uh, if you missed the first half, it will be uploaded to YouTube by tomorrow morning, most likely, uh, unless there's issues in coding for whatever reason. Uh, Tice, you can throw a link to that article in the chat if you want. Um, uh, yeah, so all of this is creative. All the stuff I make is Creative Commons, and you can go ahead and use it as part of your campaign. Um, I would ask that you give me credit, though, even if you just tell your players or if you're streaming it, anyone who's watching, that uh, this was made by Too Many Knives. Also, if you give me a tweet, I will give you a shout-out in the following episode. So that's it for tonight. Uh, have a good night. I'll stick around in chat to answer some more questions. Um, uh, but uh, that's it for tonight. So good night, Twitch, and uh, see you next time, YouTube. Bye.